Yeah, thank you everyone for the great introduction, uh, the great uh, organization. Thank you, Søren, for the invitation. It's great meeting you all. I wanted to come here for many years. Last year was a bit tricky and I was in Europe before. There was usually a long trip to coming to meetings. My name is Axel Huber. I work at Berkeley Lab. Um, I work on party accelerators. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more details in the next slides. Um, and I will speak today about a metadata standard that we developed roughly since 10 years to solve all problems and somehow a lot of people have piled up to it in our community and it's heavily based on HDF5 and hierarchical data formats. So a quick idea about my background. Um, I am a person that works deeply in team science uh, rooted in party accelerator physics um, and specifically I work on laser plasma physics for advanced accelerators. This is one of the first big team science projects in accelerator physics after the first party accelerators were invented and then scaled from the size of a palm to be multiple inches, meters, and now kilometers in size. This was the, is a typical picture. You will see people like Oppenheimer on top of this picture. There's Lawrence in the center. Um, I think there's three Nobel Prize winners in this picture, um, as it turned out in history later on. Party accelerators these days, you see a couple of really highlight projects, both in DOE and internationally, are the biggest and most expensive technical devices that we are currently building, on Earth at least. Uh, we haven't built one in space yet, would be cool concepts exist. Um, so the LHC, uh, I think it's 24 kilometers in size, um, he had Fermilab, uh, the PIP2 accelerator, important project. We have light sources, so we first accelerate electrons like the LS, and then create brilliant X-rays from them. We built novel accelerators that these days are basically a room filled with a high power laser and we focus them on a very short acceleration length of a plasma so you can accelerate particles that usually took miles to accelerate and create them in 20 centimeters to the same energies. So that's our research at Berkeley Lab that I'm part of. And then with particles like these you can create light sources like the European XFEL or LCLS. Now, I want to show you a couple of selected science cases. I'm mostly in the modeling world, but we're closely related to experiments. Um, I mentioned these short scale accelerators. That's how they look in the simulation. So instead of having these huge machines as on the right, this is PIP2 module, uh, tens of meters in length. This thing on the left hand side is tens of micrometers in size, what you see in the simulation. And then we propagate this over centimeters and reach the same energies. And if we can control it, hopefully shrink down accelerators and reach higher energies in the future. In the play, and the need for data exchange is huge in these fields because we try to build accelerators, build mod them from modules up and exchange particles from one module to the other. So this is not only in simulation between the different methods that we need to use to model them, but also with experiments and then machine learning algorithms, specifically optimization is a big, big workflow for us, but also surrogate training to go from the micro scale to the macro scale. The things that we model specifically on the plasma sites are deeply related to other plasma physics applications. Fusion energy science is a good example, like fusion, uh, initial confinement fusion is very similar to the acceleration of ions of lasers, um, but also lab astrophysics or high field physics like QED physics modules uh, and, and physics studies can be explored with that. Interestingly, in the community that I'm showing today, there are also other people piling up. For example, people that model general relativity um, with the standard that we define, um, and also people that do life science image analysis, because we have a relatively uh, fundamental metadata schema that just works for them, and so they're integrated. But I'll show this in the next slides. My talk will be outlined as follows. I will first introduce the metadata schema, open particle mesh data, and its concepts, the design principles that we use, how we make it modular and useful, beyond accelerator physics, how we separated domain science from basically the description of the physics and engineering aspects. Um, I give you an example in the Bob X application. That's one of the main applications that they develop in the Exascale Computing Project. Um, and then we go a little bit into the ecosystem, what we have built, how we leverage libraries and projects and backends such as HGF5 um, and how we integrate them. Because for us as application people, our goal is to have full start to end workflow, right? We most of the time write our applications, apply them to science cases, and then IO is another challenge that we also have to efficiently solve, and that's why we work so closely with you. So we designed this in an open community, and then at the end I will show you a couple of selected R&D highlights. I have tons of slides of things that we benchmark and so on. I will show you only slides of competitor projects that we explored with, so we have some motivating use cases. Um, there we will summarize. All right, so what are the design principles of OpenPMD? OpenPMD is a schema. Um, you can think of it of um, a schema similar as a, you could say, a mix of pie tables. 
uh, or mix of NetCDF because we have multiple data structures that we have to address at the same time. We have mesh data, which is structured grids at the moment, and we have particle data, which can be heavily interleaved and mesh refined as well. What we focus on is a high-level description. We do not reinvent anything that is done on a, on a library level like HDF5. We do at a minimal schema to annotate everything from groups to the root group to uh, layouts to series to the individual records because we need quite a bit of information to describe it. Um, and we want to make it in a way that they are human readable so we can still understand what the physics was or the numerics that was used and machine actionable. So basically the first time basically that we interacted with HDF5 and we had this implemented already two or three times in our codes, zero implementation, parallel implementation, tuned implementation, uh, implemented other libraries. The thing that was really attractive for us compared to other implementations that we had with our own binary formats or that we had with like Xeonlib was another parallel implementation that we tried with the Yiddish library is that it's self-describing and portable. But self-describing for floating point data and self-describing for physics and engineering data is still a big difference. And so what we need to add is all this information so that we can interpret this data and this is exactly what the schema comes in to tell which attributes to expect so that a particle accelerator simulation can understand a particle beam coming from a different source, for example. All right, the rest, the lower part, you see we all get from, from the five formats we implement against. It's agnostic and portable. It's scalable to supercomputers, depending on the backend that we use. And what we do then for the schema is it has a version we can forward update it by just updating metadata. metadata. Our schema is relatively lightweight, so the first straightforward implementation, for example, for analysis codes that we wrote is like less than 400 lines to pass all options that we have. Um, it's really easy to implement and it's scalable um, to really large supercomputers, which I'll show you in a, bit, in a bit. Now on the domain science side, what motivates us is really to what we show on the previous slides and talks today already is, is that we have a self-describing data format that we can use to fulfill things like a fair a data standard so that we can exchange our data, create data repositories, go between our domains and cross also the domain, for example, from experimentalists to engineers to physicists back and forth and computer scientists. So the schema, uh, the fair standard principles we saw in the previous slides in the morning um, already, so it's, it's about having findable data sets, accessible data sets, accessible we implement with multiple formats, we go back to that in the in the next slides, interoperable between the simulations and domains that I mentioned and reusable. And so it's very clear that this is exactly why we need hierarchical data formats in our backend and implement on top of those. Now, let me show you a little bit how we structure the thing. So we, I mentioned that we had already implementations in our parallel codes um, for, for HDF5 um, and we realized that we had, every time we had to re-implement this in different codes, we had to basically write another 4,000 lines of codes just to be sure that we can express it in one code, tune it properly, exchange this data. So um, what we realized then at some point is, well, it doesn't help us if you have two codes, one writes data, the other one also writes HDF5 data, but we can't even use the same post-processing tools. So what we came up with is just, we just wrote a technical document that was in roughly 2014, 15, and just wrote down, okay, if you implement HDF5, use these attributes, um, structure data series like this, so we can reach each other, read each other's data. So we published this and since then did a couple of iterations. There's a major release coming this year um, and people just implemented this. That was great, um, but at some point we wanted to go further. Um, and so we had this implementation that was running well for us, but we had roughly at the time as well as the Titan supercomputer was coming on some serious HDF5 scalability issues um, on these machines. So what we did is we looked into other hierarchical data formats and implemented more backends with the same metadata and abstracted this further. They all use the same schema, so we have implementations with RDS1 at a time, that was what we needed on Titan, um, RDS2 by now, HDF5, these are our main implementations, and then we have small implementations to things like JSON and TOML, which helps us to just transport everything that's not data, just structure, and it's super easy to modify even uh, manually by people that configure instruments, for example. Now, how do we structure our standard? We actually write one base standard that's just a general description telling us how we can structure data series, um, general meshes, um, and particles. Basically, based on that, you can build visualization schemas, but you can also understand something is a particle, and I can process this and transport it to somewhere else. On top of that, we write these so-called extensions which just add more meaning to it. So for example, if I want to describe something that's accelerator physics specific, it will be an extension on the base standard that we standardize together and you can pick and choose just like Lego the base standard plus X extensions that you need to describe your data. 
We then have a couple of reference implementations that I told you we started with, we want to be able to at least look at our data together. So we started with reference, just domain specific visualization tools, and then extend further and further. We have now reference library, and then update our scripts and validation scripts. Going into the details, so this is an HDF view uh, from an early version. You see we have this nested structure, which, which we have a root path, we have our data laid out, and we can describe in this particle and field or mesh and, and field data and particle data, and each of them can have quite a few attributes. So we have somewhere between five to 10 attributes per entry, if it's a group or variable. Most structured looks like this. We have this data series that can be encoded in different updates. You can call this iterations or snapshots of the data series. So if you have an experiment taking shots at a laser beam line, you get updates or simulation that iterates and does output. And people seem to like different formats. So what we did is we, for example, encoded, you can write in different files or inside the same file in different groups to write out your data. This has at the end series implementation details and implementation yeah, performance implications actually when you read back your data. But if you only write a short series with a few files, it can be super useful to just be able to filter them out later on. So this is just an option that people do when they open the file um, and then it's drill us out. And then we try to optimize metadata and look, for example, to encode things in variables to have open times as short as possible for really, really large data series. Inside those, we have these fields, particles, and a lot of attributes. And we also have some optional things in there like domain decomposition information, which is super important when you have 10 to 13 particles on a supercomputer and want to do a checkpoint restart workflow. You don't want to resort these particles and check which ones belong to which MPI rank. Now, one example I want to show you is the Bob X code. Bob X um, is a particle and cell code that we use for laser plasma physics. It won the Golden Bell Prize last year in supercomputing. Uh, we ran on the world's largest supercomputers we could get on our hand on. Frontier just came online, it was very exciting. And we were also running on Perlmutter, uh, NERSC, and Fugaku in Japan, um, and demonstrated that it can scale and did a science case on it. So this code is heavily GPU accelerated. Everything can be on GPU if we have GPUs. We will persistently occupy that so that we can avoid transfers. And it's otherwise spatially domain decomposed. For most of it, we also have some time parallel algorithms that we can work on. We have multiple geometries, which are which we have to describe, but the really interesting part I want to show you is we have one feature that is mesh refinement, and specifically it's built on the AMRX library that we saw already earlier today, that provides us with block structured mesh refinement capabilities. And so what we research is specifically for this electromagnetic part in cell code, how we can express mesh refinement. This basic structure of data though is what I want to show you here, not the numerics, which is the challenging part. We, what we do here is we are able to refine parts of the simulation just by having a regular, grab, a regular grid that has a final resolution two times, four times, eight times on a higher level and it's only sparsely populated. This grid point or this, this patch point itself can again be refined multiple times. We usually just do one or two levels, but IMREX generally provides arbitrary levels here. We tested out multiple implementations for output uh, formats with this. So currently what we do is we create one output version with the Arduos 2 library, where we create just one data set variable per level, and then spa sparsely fill this out with patches that keeps the metadata that, they, uh, that you have to process during open and close relatively low and works well for us. What we have to do in HDF5 currently is we create basically one variable for each level for each patch that is contiguous. Um, and that just can create quite some overhead when we open the files and deal with them, specifically with large, large series. An alternative that we saw in the morning, and that's not in OpenPMD, but directly in MREX, the implementation is to use HDF5 a bit in a way by concatenating all the patches that you have and putting them into one variable. It is totally a valid approach, but in the philosophy that we follow, at least for the OpenPMD standard, is, is that we want to continue to use as much as possible of the low-level description of the file format that we use. And it means for us, for HG5, we lose quite a bit of the self-description, right? I cannot just open this file with visitor power view and expect that it will understand the patches. I have to again implement uh, this interpretation. While what the only thing that we usually do is just add some metadata, so you can always use the uh, basic, basic tools like BP dump, um, power view, and get a default visualization that is reasonable. Now, really interesting is the sparsity proposal that we saw earlier, and I think this is exactly what will, will help us a lot here and will accelerate this. Um, for our workflows. So I'm really excited about this. I um, look forward to test this out. Now let me show you a little bit the open ecosystem, the projects and the community that we've built around this. 
So all of this started by just writing down a technical document how to write our HDF5 files. And this open PMD standard and we pushed them on GitHub. We then as a next point created like a standard tool that we use for Jupyter Notebooks because that's where most of our time is spent when we analyze data. And since then we extended this further and further. We have example data sets, we have a validator script, we have the project overview with all the projects that implemented and the reference API. Now let me talk a bit about the reference API. At some point after we've implemented this in five different codes, the schema, we realized, well, it would be great not to have 4,000 lines of code to write and read every time. So we have just implemented a reference implementation based on an earlier library that we had written just for um, HDF5 and generalized this library to be able to support multiple backends, but also have great interfaces like a modern C++ interface for us that speaks in particles and fields, what we need. And it also has things like Python bindings or now Julia bindings are coming as well, so that we can use it not only on the HPC system that writes the data, but we can also use it locally in a Jupyter Notebook or to implement backends into different tools and other user frameworks. So we have this, um, yeah, we developed this uh, like a, yeah, just a regular project on GitHub. We push things, docs out with every release and have a lot of tests that go over multiple of operating systems um, as needed by our developers and users. And then you, exactly for your workflow, you pick it up either as a library in C++ or as a Python dependency, and you can go from small scale to really large scale and process your data. Now with that actually, specifically the Python bindings were surprisingly successful because more and more people could just in really, really few lines get their first HDF5 binding implemented and had only to focus on their domain science. So we have by now this long list here of simulation codes that are only, these codes alone are all accelerator, light sources, um, the Einstein toolkit part, Carpact X in here, they are all related to big, big ecosystem and can exchange data now. So this works really well. Most of them start directly with, with HDF5, um, and if they have this backend, they can extract to other things that I showed before, like Adios and JSON and Tomo. Um, but this is really a quick way for us to implement now, and now people are yeah, just using this, and they get readily access to a lot of post-processing tools they always wanted to have access to. The other thing that this abstract, uh, abstraction also helps us to do is, as domain scientists, we usually don't have a lot of time to be able to integrate quickly in like really, really big tools. Visit is a good example, Paraview is a good example. It's really hard if you're a PhD student somewhere in Europe to find someone to explain to you a visualization tool and how to implement stuff. So what we managed to do with that is actually get now always dedicated time that some people worked and contributed just a small bit into the community to get all these things integrated. So we have a great HDF5 integration for Visit, since many years contributed by NERSC at a time. We have one in Paraview, we have a new integration in Dask, which is a lot of fun for parallel processing. YTs from the astrophysics community helps us a lot with mesh refinement data. Rapids and Pandas is a lot of fun to work with, so this is basically data frames and data frames on steroids of GPUs. Um, and at the end now, it's exactly one line to get your data from HDF5 as particle into a data frame back and forth for us. Um, and the implementation of this is then like four lines. This is exactly the Lego principle that we want to do, the modularity. And due to that, we are able with yeah, just small contributions to really get this connection. These are the people that all contribute to this. It started at the time as a collaboration between Berkeley Lab and my, the lab that was in, National Lab in Germany, HCDR in Dresden. Um, and since then, we have additions and contributions from all these labs um, that help us to achieve our goals. I try to keep track of about everyone that submits pull requests and features. So this is the list of people. Um, who I'm extremely grateful for to, to build this. Um, and I hope I got everyone. That was the last point. I just want to show you a few selected R&D highlights, mostly from HPC, um, for features that we looked into, specifically for fast reads and a couple of directions that we are exploring currently in terms of streaming. So the first thing, and I like this read in the morning as well as the, the comment that we had is, we quite early had a problem as well that our data, even if we can transport it quickly to disk, it is just too large to process. So to what everyone told me is, just compress it. You have a factor four, your data is smooth, you have to resolve it anyway, let's try this. And so I did a little bit of math and we found out, well, actually, compressing alone is not sufficient to be actually faster than I.O. It has to be a really, really fast compressor these days. So what we explored here is how we could parallelize and use more CPUs while we are actually crunching on the GPUs during I.O so that we can go below the theoretical threshold that we then measured and compared against. So there's a little performance model that tells you if you don't fulfill this, even before you start your simulation, don't turn on the compressor. Like it will take longer than just writing your data out. 
but we are just already in the morning. We recently did some benchmarks, and this is now comparing specifically to different data layouts. So there's a study from two years ago um, that we did looking specifically at things like logically contiguous data versus chunk data versus chunk data plus subfiling. So things that come specifically in HDF5 1.14 as well. Um, and compared them for both writing, but specifically reading as well. Multi-dimensional reading of data. And what's really interesting for us is if we write out 100 terabytes per time steps, two to four petabytes per simulation, how can we efficiently parallelly process this data? And it turns out at the scale we talk about here, chunking and subfiling is what you always want to do if you want to do parallel cost processing. And so these are the benchmarks for reading and writing with different layouts. We recently had the full scale run on Frontier, exceeding and really leveling out the file system bandwidth and getting the two tier luster system there um, to the maximum of Adios, which is one of the backends that we have. I'm really looking forward to repeat this um, with the HDF5.114 version, but I didn't have the time yet. Um, and the next update, uh, what we looked into is another thing that was shown in the last slide, which is looking into how can we actually overcome having to go into disk in the first place. So what we already have is this nice C++ interface that speaks exactly like, this is a structured mesh, this is a particle. So we can write already now MPI parallel applications that can be like up to 10, 15 lines of Python code that can consume this data from disk. And so what we changed now is why do I have to go from one step to another? Why don't I just do a busy loop and consume this data as a stream? And so what we showed in this, uh, in this benchmark here is we were benchmarking, can we consume the data as it's produced? And instead of writing in C2 analysis in our application in pure C++, can we write this in Python because it's basically like writing a post-processing script, just extremely parallel out of the sudden. And so we did first ex uh, benchmarks here, and obviously if you consume the data over the network, you can exceed the bandwidth of the file system and show that we can actually proceed here and scale up to really big problems if we want to have just a quick new in situ analysis written for a science case. In practice, it could be really complex, could be things like data source, reduce the data, buffer the data, and then feature extraction, but we could pile them up by writing just tunes of Python scripts, basically pipe from one and another, and then fulfill the equation, actually that I showed you earlier, of don't spend too much time in your reduction, otherwise you will get backlog. And so we're currently exploring like things like placement for sources, um, how do you want to stream over the network and so on, which is then naturally uh, something you have to be aware of. Now with that, let me just quickly summarize. I showed you OpenPMD, which is a standardized schema for particle and mesh-based data. We publish and develop this as an open source ecosystem on GitHub. It starts with a documentation. We have a lot of example data and validation scripts and reference libraries and integrations to work with. Our community evolves this practices by open source development um, and leveraging heavily the implementation of hierarchical data formats and specifically HDF5. And in future directions, we are currently in the way of integrating deeper with experimental data systems and um, using the same systems we know from HPC there, specifically as in our experiments, data rates go up and up for the advanced accelerator research. And our real goal is to actually establish, and it's unfortunately not a thing in our field because it's so hard to, to get there if you don't have standards first, to establish these open data repositories that we can do meta studies, for example, over many experiments at a time. And with that, I look forward to any of your questions. Um, these are our contacts um, from Slack to GitHub to homepages. Please feel free to reach out, benchmark us, um, <laughs> let us know what you find. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. On the left? Yeah. Yeah. So this is yeah, this is comparing basically a standard file output and the the gray line here is the bandwidth, the parallel bandwidth of the file system. All right. So this is these two techniques are two just two ways to do regular parallel I.O. And at some point you hit the roof line of or the hit the ceiling of your parallel file system. That's the main reason why they go up. The blue line here is doing the same workflow that we would have done on a file in the network. So you write, instead of writing to file and then a post-processing, and this one is only measuring the output, we do immediately the full stream to the processing and measure the overhead that we get from that. So the blue line will be limited next time, um, depending on your transport over the network. So you will reach a limit as well there. 
because your your network is usually not a, a, like a full torus. Yeah. The, yeah, they have, they have the felt bandwidth by the application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all, it's all. Which one? The yellow or the blue line? The blue line is the blue line is already starting to tank because we're already starting to exceed the the the, the network. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mark? Excellent. I'm, I'm curious about how standardized this is. How many people sort of were involved in its creation and its building? And then how many people got to revise it? Yeah. So the the initial version we wrote was, uh, I think, maybe eight people, right? Uh, with iterations. And then you have, of course, a lot of people that, some people that write most of it, and the other people that. And some small in review. Um, currently, I think we are a little bit over 14 ish, and we have like the fourth revision now. But yeah. All right. Any more questions? All right, then. Thank you so much.